Hey, church. I'm glad you're here. And our theme, Time, Treasure, and Talent, uh, begins this month. But I, I'm going to bend the theme a little bit to fit with my message. Because uh, I just had something else pretty strong on my heart. Felt like I was supposed to bring that, so that's what I'm going to do. And, and I'll, I'll tell you about it in a moment. But uh, first, it is good to be home. Janet and I were in Indonesia. I was preaching in Jakarta. Um, this last week, we got back just a few days ago. Had some tremendous results. God is doing things, amazing things in that nation. But it's, it's so good to be home. There's no place like being right here at Cottonwood Church. <clears throat> so, with the theme, what's on my heart, I want to talk to you about family. And I suppose it sort of fits into time, treasure, and talent. One of our greatest treasures is the family. And it's something we should certainly devote a lot of time to. It's a, an amazing privilege and stewardship, stewardship we have to raise a family. But I, I just want to encourage you, whether you are the parents of young children, whether you're in a grandparent or great-grandparent stage, whether you're single and never want to be married, um, whatever stage of life you're in, whatever circumstance you're in, whatever season you happen to be in, even though the primary focus today is going to be family and children, listen, I believe that if you'll put your little antennas up, the Holy Spirit has a specific word for you today. A word for you in your circumstance, a word for you in your season, <clears throat> something that you can take with you and put into practice, something that, that you can use, something that'll be a key to a door that you need open. God just has a way of doing that. He can speak to all of us different things all at the same time. So I would like you to find Psalm 127, if you would. We're going to spend our time there today in Psalm 127. And uh, once you find that, we want to pray, and we'll get started. Psalm 127. Heavenly Father, we humbly ask you to teach us today by your Holy Spirit. We take your word as a heritage. We take it as our final authority. Lord, we ask you to instruct us, not so we can just gain more knowledge, but so we can put it into practice, that your kingdom might go forward, that your blessing might rest upon our lives, that we might be a blessing to others, and ultimately that Jesus Christ would be glorified. Amen. All right, Psalm 127, beginning in verse 1, a song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, they shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. I like the way the psalm starts. In verse 1, it says, a song of ascents. That designation is actually found in a number of the psalms. And it literally means in the Hebrew language, a song of going to a higher place. Now, I'm quite certain there's a musical designation there, but I think there's another meaning in it as well that God wants us to get. He wants to take us higher. He wants to take our families higher. There are new levels that God wants to bring us to, and as we embrace the truths in this psalm, God can and will take us to a higher place. Everybody say higher. Higher. Now, Right away, I, I see a, a tension in the psalm. The Lord is building, yet someone is laboring. The Lord is guarding, yet someone is watching. It's a, a, a tension between reliance and action. God has his part, but we also have our part. 
We're trusting God to build, yet we still labor. We rely on him to protect, yet we still set a watchman. You see, God primarily does his building and his guarding through us as we look to him for guidance, strength, and wisdom. And he will help us in the things that we can do, and then he will do the things that we cannot do if we solicit his help. Now, there's certainly a lot of applications that you could use these verses for, but the main import has to do with the family. In fact, where it says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. The Hebrew word for house there is literally family. Unless the Lord builds the family, they labor in vain who build it. In fact, the Hebrew word for son, the Hebrew word for daughter, and the Hebrew word for family all find their root in the word build in this verse. God is promising us that, that he will build a legacy through our sons and daughters, you know, for our families and for his kingdom if we invite him in and solicit his help to build and to guard. And he says, it's vain for us to sit up late and rise up early and eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. How many have eaten their meals in sorrow and lost sleep over family matters? especially issues with children. That God says it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually rest because he will guard and he will build. You know, just the fact that our children grow up, it doesn't diminish in the slightest their ability to impact our hearts, positively or negatively. And he said in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, literally a gift from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb a reward. Children are a gift and a reward. They are not a punishment. <laughs> <clears throat> and to any young parents here today that you have an active child or active children or overactive children, I have a word from heaven for you today. You will survive. <laughs> you will. You know, we had a two and a half year old and then Janet gave birth to the twins. And I remember it was probably six weeks into it. I walk in the bedroom. She's sitting up in the bed. She's actually got a child on each breast. She's got feeding both of the kids. Her eyes are open and nobody's home. <laughs> she was the picture of absolute exhaustion and my heart just broke as I looked at her. And if you talk to Janet today, she has no memory of the first three months after the twins were born. It's just a blur to her. But she survived, and I survived, and you will survive as well. And it says children are like arrows. As parents, we can send our children out like arrows, far and true. We can send them into the world with faith in God, with hope, with a sense of eternity. We can send them out with a heart that embraces honesty, integrity, justice, and compassion, especially if they've seen those things modeled in the home. And I know some would say, well, Pastor, you know, we, we didn't really, we didn't know the Lord when we are raising our kids, and, you know, we did so much wrong, or we, we, you know, we failed to do things that we should have done. We just didn't know, and, you know, we look back, and, and man, if we, if we could do things over, we, we would. Well, the, the truth is, None of us can change the past. We can't go back and do the things that we should have done that we failed to do, nor can we go back and undo the things that we shouldn't have done. And God doesn't want us to wallow in condemnation. That's the devil's quicksand. But what he does want us to do is to pray. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer for your family. God hears and answers prayer. God can change things through prayer. God can reach our children through prayer, regardless of where they might be in life. I remember as a young believer, I uh, knew this gal, and she said, Bayless, my brother's going to come uh, live with me for a while. He's coming from out of state, and I just had it in my heart to have you come over and have breakfast with us. I want you to meet my brother. But you need to know he's very anti-gospel, very anti-Christian. He's not open at all. 
but I'd like you to meet him. So I, I come over one morning for breakfast. He's, he's moved into the home there. And I can tell this guy's very guarded. You know, we're, we're enjoying a nice breakfast, but there's this sort of invisible wall that's up. You just feel it in the atmosphere. And then out of the blue, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, he is an artist. I looked at him, I said, you're an artist, aren't you? And he got the funniest look on his face, he says, well, yeah. He said, you wanna see some of my paintings? I said, sure. And he brought a bunch of his paintings and put them in his sister's garage. I go in, he's got like a dozen canvases, and we go through all these paintings and look at them, and then he turns on me in the garage, and he said, how did you know I was an artist? I said, well, actually sitting at the breakfast table, God told me you were an artist. And the change in his countenance was immediate. I wish I could really describe it to you. It was almost like a light went on. And you could read it on his face like, God knows me? And the whole atmosphere shifted. We had a really holy moment there in the garage. And within two days, he got saved and became a radical Christian. Now, that wasn't because of my sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. What caused that was a praying sister. Don't underestimate the power of your prayers. I'm telling you, God answers prayer, and he can touch your family regardless of where they may be. He said, blessed is the man that has his quiver full of them. The quiver's the case that would hold the arrows. And first thing God says about our children, once we've invited God in to build and to guard, he says, your children, they shall not be ashamed. To me, that's a promise from God that our families will be saved. Listen to this verse, Isaiah 45 and 17. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. The removal of shame is one of the first fruits of a salvation experience. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, for I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. I believe that our families will be saved. And then he went on and he said, and they will speak with the enemies at the gate. Another translation says he will never be defeated when he meets his enemies. And that can be looked at a couple of ways. You know, the city gate, especially in ancient times, was a real focal point of attack. If a city was, if a city was, was um, you know, under attack from an adversary, because if the gates fell, the city would fall. The main entrance to the city would be open, and so they, they would put gates and fortify that, that particular area. So it was a point of concentrated attack. And I believe God is saying, listen, if I build the family, if I guard the family, you don't have to worry about your children being overwhelmed by the powers of darkness. The enemy will not gain entrance into your children's life. They'll speak with the enemies in the gate and they will not be defeated. And I think as well, we need to look at it the way the scriptures do. Because in the ancient world and throughout the Bible, the city gates were the place of commerce. It's the place that business was transacted. And you know, sooner or later, our children are gonna find out that the world is filled with unscrupulous and dishonest people that will deal crookedly in life and in business, but the God we serve can protect them and cause them to succeed and not be defeated as they live out their life's calling and pursue whatever kind of business that God has led them into. Now we have our part to build, <clears throat> but God has his part. We need to guard, but God will do his part and we can lay ourselves down in confidence and sleep and have rest because we know God will guard and build our children wherever they go. Now here's just some other thoughts that have just really fastened themselves on my heart and mind over the last few weeks. And the first one, if you notice at the end of verse 2, it says, God gives his beloved sleep. Vain to sit up late, rise up early, for God gives his beloved sleep 
And then he right away says, children are a heritage from the Lord. And those two thoughts are connected. God's speaking to the parents. He says, look, you're his beloved. He'll give you sleep. And then he talks about the kids. You know what beloved means? It's pretty simple. It means to be loved by God. Ma'am, you are loved by God. Sir, you are loved by God. More than you have the capacity to understand it, you are beloved. And you see, the greatest thing we can give to our children is to love them. But we can never fully do that until we embrace the fact that we are loved by God. God wants to love us, and then he wants to love our children through us. I don't know if you've ever considered this or not, but in all of the Gospels, there are only three occasions where God spoke audibly in connection with his son. Only three times. Once in John 12, Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I've glorified it and will glorify it. The second time was at Jesus' baptism. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. And <clears throat> at that baptism, God spoke to his son about his son. It's the only place in the Gospels that we have any record of God speaking to his son about his son. Now, I'm certain many times that Jesus prayed, the Father spoke to him, but we have no record of that. God the Father left us one record of one thing that he spoke to his son about his son. It was actually threefold. The voice came from heaven and said, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The third time God spoke was at the Mount of Transfiguration, and he basically said the identical thing to the disciples. This is my son, whom I love. Hear him. So the one record of all the things that God may have said to his son, the creator of the universe, the heavenly father, wants to leave humanity one record of something he said to his son about his son. No record of anything else. You are my son, acceptance, whom I love, affection. With you, I am well pleased, affirmation. Acceptance, affection, and affirmation. Why would God have given us the one record of what he said to his son? And that be it. Because I believe he wants us to understand the importance of communicating those things to our children. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're part of this family. You belong. Acceptance. I love you. And show them that you love them. Hug them. Demonstrate affection. And you may be, you know, from a, a, a long line of you know, non-affectionate family members. My dad was never affectionate growing up. But that's just because his daddy was the same way. That's just the way he learned it. That was the only model he had. He was a little better than his dad, but he wasn't real good at it. We've tried to be better, you know, in our family about it. Now, to me, the, the, the best example I've ever found is Gene Petrini and his family. And I don't know if it's the Italian, Sicilian thing, but they're the huggiest, kissiest, most affectionate family I've ever seen. The Petrini's, that's the gold standard when it comes to family affection. Amazing. I want to be like that. And then affirmation. I'm well pleased with you. Even if they're really not doing well at the moment, hey, I believe in you. Yeah. I know you're trying. You have what it takes. Those three things our kids need to hear from us. There are many, many wounded men and wounded women that struggle in life every day because they didn't receive those things growing up. Kids and young people will look for those three things in all the wrong places if they don't receive them in the home. And listen to me, parent, if you'll just give those three things to your kids, acceptance, affection, and affirmation. You have done a lot for them. You have done 
a lot. Every person craves those three things. Every person needs those three things. How blessed is the child that receives them in the home? It builds confidence, stability, and security. Acceptance, affection, and affirmation. And then it goes on in the psalm, and it it says that children are like arrows in our hand. You know, our, our hand, the hand is what draws back the bowstring and determines the impetus and the distance the arrow will go. The hands determine the direction the arrow will go out. God wants to use us to influence our children in the way they should go. You know, a warrior never wasted his arrows. He didn't have an unlimited supply. He was always very precise and careful with his aim. A warrior didn't just, you know, shoot an arrow up in the sky and say, well, hope it hits something. Never know. No, they only had a few precious arrows and they took careful aim. And they would draw the bowstring back and set the trajectory just right so that they would hit the target. Our job is to observe and then aim our children in the direction of their gifting. I'll say that again. Our job is to observe and then aim our children in the direction of their gifting. I bet you know this verse, Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Now, that doesn't just mean, you know, you you teach them right from wrong. You know, what you think they should do, you tell them that. Now, actually, the classic Amplified Bible digs out a bit more of the Hebrew meaning. And it says, train a child up in the way he should go, and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. With his God-given inclinations, with her God-given inclinations. Train the child in the way they should go. What is the way they should go? It's in line and in keeping with their individual gift or bent. And he talks about children of one's youth. The best time to start is when you're a young parent and your children are little. They'll begin displaying certain traits, certain inclinations. Look for those traits and then help to develop them for God's glory and possibly for their future employment. And you know, our kids are all in their, their 30s and we're in the grandparent stage of life and it's glorious. We got three grandsons. There's Asher, he's nine. Sawyer, seven. Clay is two. Uh, Asher... <clears throat> He's really, really athletic, but he also has an amazing mind for numbers. He can do complex math computations in his mind very quickly. We're on family vacation. Not too long ago, Asher and I are outside playing darts, so I throw my darts, he throws his darts. As I'm walking up the dartboard, I go, okay, Asher, I got a a triple 18, I got a a double 11, and I got a four, you got a triple 11, oh, a triple six, and a, a 14. And by the time I have said that, he's already added the sums and he tells me what the two scores are. And I look at him like, how did you do that? And he looks back at me like, what are you, stupid grandpa? (laughs) And I'm like, I don't think you're right, Asher. So I'll sit there and I'll take about a minute and, you know, I'll add up the numbers and you're right. He says, well, duh. (laughs) We go inside the house, we're playing chess. Ten minutes into the game, I realize I'm in trouble. (laughs) He's going to beat me. And I was kind of saved because Harrison called from outside and said, Asher, you want to come play badminton? Asher says, Papa, I'll be back in a few minutes. I want to go play badminton. So he runs outside. As soon as he got out the door, I knocked all the pieces off (laughs) the chessboard. No way I'm letting a nine-year-old beat me at chess. (laughs) Not happening. Asher loves school. Now, his younger brother, Sawyer, who's seven, he's not quite so fond of school. (laughs) And he loves creating things with his hands. Spends hours and hours every day in the backyard with bits of wood and metal making things. His favorite gift he's ever gotten was a toolbox that he was given when he was six. Pliers, saws, hammers, all those kind of things in the toolbox. 
One day, he's out there less than an hour. He comes in with bits of wood and metal. He's made a folding pocket knife that actually works. I looked at it. I don't even think I could make that. <laughs> now, our great privilege as parents and as grandparents is to observe them and encourage them in the area of their gifting and to teach them both through instruction and example that their gifts should ultimately be used for God's glory. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, what's my destiny? You know, what, what's my calling in life? And I think those are pretty good questions. But I think a better question might be, what is God up to? What's God doing in the world? What's God doing in my city? What is God doing in my church? And then how does my gifting fit into that? How can I use my inclinations and in what I'm good at within the scope of what God is doing? And you know, I think it's also important that we don't love or favor one child more than another because their gifts or their bent are similar to ours. That can cause problems. You know, Isaac loved Esau more than he loved Jacob because Esau was a man of the fields and he was a hunter. And Isaac loved that. But Rebekah loved Jacob more because Jacob was a man of the tents. The scripture said he liked to be indoors. And that favoritism on both of the parents' parts because one child was like one, one child was like another, one loved more than the other, the other one loved this one more, it created huge grief and problems in the family. We have to be careful not to show favoritism to a child or love them more because they are like us. I have an uncle. <clears throat> On his side of the family, he was heir to a lumber company. It had been in the family in, in Virginia for generations, generation after generation after generation. They had this very lucrative lumber business, lumber mill, and he was the, the you know, heir apparent. He's going to take it over just like his father and his father's father and his father's father's father had had this, this lumber company. And he went to his dad and said, Dad, I just don't feel like I'm supposed to be a lumberman. He said, I feel like my gifting's in the area of interior design. I want to be an interior designer. And his father did something that not many dads would do. He said, okay, son, and he sold the business. Father decided that he was going to spend the rest of his life traveling the world in luxury. And my uncle went into the interior design business. He's been very successful and very happy at doing that. The thing is, though, most children will not be courageous enough or intuitive enough to do that. And so what happens many times is they end up getting squeezed into a mold that never really fit them. And consequently, they're never fully fulfilled in life. And they never really have the complete impact that they perhaps could if they were walking in the fullness of their gifting. You see, our children, they're like arrows in our hands. We can touch them, bless them, direct them, give them energy, give them trajectory and send them out. We're the bowstring, the hands that pull it back, and we send them out for God. And you know, that is the purpose of arrows, to send them out. The warrior doesn't say, hey, look at my arrow collection. But don't touch, I keep them here with me always. You know, the parent that's that helicopter parent that's always hovering over their children and never wants them to be out on their own, that's not what God wants. Our privilege, responsibility, and purpose as parents, as leaders, as, as grandparents, is to send them out, to send the arrows out into the world, to send them out, send them out with faith in God, send them out with instruction, send them out with financial help if we can, send them out with prayer. But arrows are to be sent out. They're not to be kept at our side and guarded always. And notice he said arrows in the hands of a warrior. That means you're going to have to fight for your kids. You're going to have to fight in the place of prayer for your kids. 
Many a night, Janet and I stayed up praying over our kids when they were sick, when they were little. And you know what? The fact that they're grown has not diminished or lessened their need for our prayers. They have not outgrown their need for our prayers, nor will they ever. So we're still warriors. Mama, you're a warrior. Daddy, you're a warrior. Pray over your kids' health. Pray over their future. Pray that the eyes of their understanding will be enlightened. Pray that they'll get the right connections in life and that God will dislodge them from the wrong people. Pray. We are to be warriors. And listen, if your kids are grown or you realize that you haven't helped them discover their gifting, it's not too late. God will help us. It begins unless the Lord builds the house. If we'll invite him in, he'll build. If we invite him in, he'll guard. It's not too late. It doesn't matter where our kids are, how off track they might be, whatever state our family might be in, we need to invite the master builder in, and he will help us. But you know what? It's not right to say, well, Lord, you need to come build. I need this help here and that, but don't come on the property. <clears throat> we need to give the builder full access, beginning with us. It's not like, well, Lord, help my kids and help this area, but, you know, I've got these rooms I don't want you to go in. And so, Lord, notice I've got a no trespassing sign in front of my finances. Don't go there. And I got another no trespassing sign in front of my attitudes. Don't go there. And I got a no access sign here, and I got a no access sign here, and I got an off limit sign here, and you just build what I want you to build, but you leave the rest of this stuff alone. No, it's, it's all access or no access. He wants it all. And it needs to be, Lord, you come in, and whatever you want to knock down, you can knock down. Whatever kind of wrong thinking I've got, you want to get rid of it, bulldoze it. Whatever you want to build up, build up. You're the master builder, and I give you full and complete access to me and to my family. Lord, I want you to build. I want you to guard. And here's everything. Another way to say that is you need to make Jesus Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Boss, full access. And you know, you will find out pretty doggone quick that God is not a taker, he's a giver. Yeah. I think the devil whispers in people's ears, man, if you ever do that, your life is over. Life is gonna be boring. <laughs> That's a lie. You start on the biggest adventure you've ever lived right. if you walk by faith in Christ alone. It's amazing. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment if you would. <clears throat> I want to invite you to pray with me. Maybe you've never given the Lord full access to your life. Maybe you've never... told the builder that you can do anything you want. Build me up or you want me build up. What you want removed, remove it. You will be amazed and delighted at the finished product. You'll love what he does. And I say finished product, actually, as long as we're in these flesh and blood bodies, it's an ongoing work, but it's a glorious work. And you may be here today and you walk with the Lord at one point in your life, but for whatever reason, your heart is far from him. You know it, God knows it. Maybe a leader that you looked up to failed you. Maybe even betrayed you and that somehow became a wedge between you and God. Maybe you just started hanging around with the wrong crowd and, and little by little, sort of incrementally, you found yourself adrift from God, and now as you look up, the shore is so far away you can hardly see it. And you think, I don't know if I could ever get back. And maybe it's just, just willful rebellion. Well, either way, God's not mad at you, but it's time for you to come home, prodigal son. Time to come home, prodigal daughter. 
And you may be here today, maybe your very first time here at Cottonwood, maybe the first time in a church, I don't know. But you wouldn't be here if you didn't have a hungry heart. And I've got good news for you. This is not about religious ritual. It's not about mindless ceremony. It's not about some endless list of stuff you're no longer allowed to do. It's about having a relationship with your creator. And the only way to come to him is through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, his son, died on the cross for the sin of the world. The world had become separated from God because of sin. Jesus came and bridged that gap. And he died as our substitute. Literally the son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, worked miracles, talked about God as a loving father, not some aloof, distant entity, but as a father that cared about us so much that he's actually numbered the hairs on our head. And he was taken by jealous hands and crucified, and there on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth, the sky turned dark, and the just punishment of God against the sin of the world was poured out on his own son as Jesus willingly became our sin substitute. After three days and three nights, the claims of God's justice was forever satisfied. Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was raised from the dead, and the Bible says if you believe it, and you're willing to confess him as Lord, say, come on in, Master Builder, that God changes you from the inside out. It's so radical. The scripture uses terms like being born again, becoming a new creation in Christ, being converted, being regenerated. Literally, the sin nature is taken out of you. You're brought into contact with the living God. No one else can make the decision for us. We have to make it on our own. And I'm just going to ask you right now, no one's looking around but me. If you're ready to make that decision, I'm just going to count to three. And if you want to pray this prayer after me, I want you to raise your hand when we get to three. I'll acknowledge any hands that go up. You can put them down, and then we're just all going to pray a prayer together. And that uplifted hand, as simple as that seems, I think it can help your faith begin to move toward God. The Bible says faith is expressed through actions. Just consider the reflection of your heart. Your heart's reaching out to God. Your hand's just a mirror image of that. One. It's your day, my friend. Two. You ready? You want to pray together? Three. You should lift your hand. A lot of hands all over the auditorium. Keep them up for just a minute. That's awesome. I can see those hands, but more importantly, God sees your heart. That's what really counts here. All right. Looks like every section. Go ahead and put your hands down. Let's everybody in the house put a hand over our heart. Let's tie our heart around these words and let, let's talk to God for a minute. Just say, oh God, I come to you. I humble my heart in your presence. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died upon the cross to take away all my sin. I believe he was raised from the dead. Jesus, come into my life. I accept you now as my Lord and my Savior from this moment forward. All that I am and all that I have, I place in your hands, Jesus. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. <clears throat>